let's start with that. So we have to start two bases that I care about. So I have decimal and binary, and I have what's called diminished rate x and rate x this way. And this leads me to four complementary systems that we talked about. In decimal, I have nines and tens. And in binary, I have ones and twos. Let me back up and get our, our brains pumping. What was a rate x? What, what did rate x mean to me? It's kind of more interchangeable with another word. Yeah. Yes, it is the base. So I might have mentioned to you last class that we often call this a decimal point, and that's a reference to the fact we're talking about a decimal number, which is fine when we are. But if we're in a different base, this is no longer a decimal point. You can call it a rate x point. That's a neutral way to refer to it in any base, right? You're just kind of referring to the base itself. So when I say diminished rate x or rate x, what I'm talking about is diminishing what is called our basis. Our basis, anyone remember what the basis was the same as for all intents and purposes? Yeah, the range. The range, that's right. So the basis for our purposes is the range. Now, if it's diminished rate x, what we're saying is it's range minus one, and if it's regular rate x, we're saying it's just the range. And what else is it good to know about what we need to know about the basis that kind of separates it from the range is we're specifically talking about the number of digits. So if I have a three-digit decimal number, my basis for this if it's diminished rate x, is 999. And my basis for this, if it's regular rate x, is the range, which is 1,000, right? So that's kind of the important prerequisites we need to know. We need to understand how to find our basis, what basis we'll have for each of these, and if the important things to know are your range and the number of digits, all right? So my range for three digits in decimal is 1,000. My range for three digits in decimal diminished rate x is still 1,000, but it's diminished rate x, so I subtract one and I get 999. My range for four bits in binary, what's my range for four bits? One and then four zeros. Yeah, one and then four zeros. Yes, because 16. So in decimal, but you're absolutely right, you should say one and four zeros because I didn't ask for it in decimal. Um, this is 16, right? Remember the trick to that was that if you put your weights up here, these are my four bits in question. Whatever the weight is of the next number that wasn't part of what I'd asked, that is your range, right? So you're absolutely right. The range for four bits is 16 because you have zero to 15. So in twos complementary, if I have four bits, my range is 16, but in ones, it's 15 or one, 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 right? So in diminished, that would be my range or my basis, right? Okay, so that's it. That's the whole mechanics of what we need to know to kind of get started. Let's get started with nines, comp diminished rate x. So what we're gonna do first is start with a negative number. Let's start with negative 150. The important thing to know right off the bat is that to me, the human, this is 150 with a negative sign. I give this to the computer, it takes the complement, and then it deals with the number only as a representation of the complement. It doesn't care about this again until it wants to give it back to me as a number. So first I have to figure out how to do that, how to take the complement. I take my basis, and since this is nines, and I have three digits, I have a nine, nine, nine basis. Basically a nine for every digit. Nines come, nine for every digit, not hard. 
I take this and I subtract it out. And I get my representation. So when you start with the value, you end up with the representation. Now this number here, this is what the computer cares about. This is what it puts in memory. This is what it does arithmetic with. This is what it works with until I ask the human to see this again. And when I ask to see this again, because this is true, and I can take the negative of the negative and go back to the original, I can do this. Subtract this out. And I have a 150. Sorry, that's a horrible zero. Looks like a six. I have a 150, but remember, I did this because I wanted a negative number. So there's a negative here. Not breaking math. I'm not making some new mathematical law that you know goes against everything you've ever learned. I'm putting this here because I wanted a negative number, because the whole point of doing this was to get a negative number, right? So that is why I have a negative there. So I can do this all day. I can flip back and forth and move from one to another. Now, let's kind of see the mechanics of what's happening here. I'm gonna put a number line up here. We're gonna have our, our modulus. For your modulus, it's where zero is. It's where you move from negative space to positive space. Down here, I'm going to have my values. So I have zero to 499. And on this side, I have negative 499. Interestingly enough, again, you might remember from sine and magnitude, I have my friend the negative zero. Let's see that for a second, that negative zero. If we have a basis of 999, which we do, because this is three digits, nine's top. And I subtract negative zero from it, because we know we can do that, because we want to find a representation by using the value. That means that I end up with 9999. Look at that. That's my representation. And if I do the reverse, and I take my representation, and I subtract it from the basis, I end up with negative zero. Why is it negative? Because I did this, so I know I'm looking for a negative, so it's negative, right? So that is negative zero. Now that's going to cause issues for us in math, uh, which you're going to see in a moment. So this is kind of, by the way, I'll just kind of give up the ghost right away. This is the major reason why we don't use, um, well, in binary, we don't use ones, comp, and use twos. But it's easier, as you'll see in a moment, to see why this whole system works at all if we focus first on ones and then move to twos. And we're using decimal first just to understand this would be to use numbers. So the math is more clear. All right. So we have our values, but now let's look at our representations. In the positive space, this is exactly the same. I have 0 to 499. These are my representations. But in the negative space, this is completely different. Let's take negative 499. So if I want to find the representation for that, I take my basis, 499, and I end up with 500. So my representation here is 500. And we already did negative zero. My representation here is 9999. So normally when you look at a number line, you go from a larger number to a smaller number. It's obviously a bigger number of digits to represent the smaller number in the negative space, but you're going to a smaller number with bigger representation. Here you're doing the opposite. You're still going to negative, smaller negative values, but you're doing it by actually reversing the representation. I have a 500 here that's going up to a 9999. Now what that means is that all of our math only has to be addition, and we never have to worry about negative numbers. Let me, let me show you that part. So let's start with 200 plus, and I'm going to kind of be explicit about this, negative 300. So if we take this and we put it on our number line, 
We're going to start here or so at 200. And remember, 200 is both a representation and a value. And one thing that I know I said last time that I want to reiterate is that the way that we can look at a number and instantly know if we're going to have to get a representation or if it is a representation is that it's more than half of the range is on the top half. So for threes, uh, for three digits of nines come, that means that it's a 500 or greater. So five, six, seven, eight, or nine in the first digit means it's negative, which means I see this, I know this is negative. I know it's a negative representation, right? So that's kind of the trick. If it's a zero, one, two, three, or four positive number, there's nothing to do. So when I look at this equation, I'm good with the 200, nothing to do. When I look at this, I know I need to get a representation because this is a negative number. So the computer's going to take a complement. And I put the nines up here, it's going to subtract, and it's going to end up with its representation. So 699 represents negative 300. Now, what we're actually doing is this, 200 plus 699. Remember, the computer only cares about this guy until it's time to give it back to us. So what we're really doing here is this. We're going from 200, and we're not going 300 that way. We never go this way anymore. Just ignore that. There's no more left travel on the number one. It's over. We're going this way. Now, because we have a set range, I only have three digits. This number line repeats. Right? If I said there's no limit on the number of digits, then sure, the number line is going to keep growing. Right? But I didn't say that. I said we only have three digits. So you just max out what you can represent in positive space to three digits. What happens? If you go to 500, guess what happened? You wrapped around. Right? So you're going to go from positive space back to negative space, back to positive space, back to negative space. You keep going with this. But for us, what it means is we're going to come down here. And we're going to come in this way. Let's see how far. So we take our 200 here. I'm, I'm kind of reversing this just to make it easier, but remember originally it was 200 plus 600. I'm trying not to make a mess on the board in this edition, so it doesn't matter. But up there I have the 699. So here it's 899. So this is the number, remember the computer cares about. This is what it has. That's the result of the math. 899 is right about here. So my arrow here comes in and lands me there. Let's see if this makes sense. We know this is a representation because it starts with an 8. Let's subtract it from the basis. And we get our negative 100. And remember, of course, I did the, one, the negative here because I bothered to find this value. So I know it's negative. So there you go. So negative 100. And that makes sense on the number line, right? We're right where one, negative 100 should be, give or take. And all is good with the world. This works out perfectly. Sometimes you'll see this called wraparound because I went from positive space into negative space. Um, but there's nothing special to know or do. Notice that we were able to solve what would have been a subtraction problem with addition. We were able to solve it with only positive numbers or representations of negative numbers, life is good, right? Now, there's a problem, of course, here. So this was wrapped around, let's, I'm gonna just invert this. Instead of 200 minus 300, let's do minus 200 plus 300. Simple, simple inversion. We need our representation of this guy, right? There we go, 7.99. Let's reset our number line here. So we're starting now at 7.99, which is a little bit further back, somewhere around here. And we know our value for that is negative 200. Now we're going to add 300. 
We're always going this way, remember? Let's see where we land. All right, so this is a little bit of a mess. We ended up with an extra digit. It's obviously not the right answer because we all know it's 100. We're smart like that. So what happened here? Anyone know what, what happened here? Yeah. Did we count both the zeros or one of the zeros? Well, you're right in that we need to. We haven't actually yet, but we're about to see how we are. Um, let, me, let me back up because you are right. That is a problem. But what this guy represents here, the fact that we ended up with this fourth digit, that represents we went across the modulus. In fact, if you added more than two numbers, say you added three or four numbers and you actually crossed the modulus more than once, this number would increment for every time you did. So all this number is, is telling you that you crossed the modulus. Now, interestingly enough, the problem with that is what you said, that I have this thing of zero. In fact, we can kind of visualize that this way. If we imagine that we have negative four plus five, right? And let's kind of get microscopic here with the number line. And we have positive zero and negative zero. And then what do we need here? So we, we want one, that's our destination. So here we have negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, right? So we start here and we add five. One, two, three, four, five. Crap, what happened there? Landed on zero. Obviously the answer is one, right? We all know that. What happened is this guy, right? This guy messed us up. So that's the problem. Now what we can do is because we know this tells us how many times we cross the modulus, if we cross the modulus from negative space to positive space, that must mean we pass the zero. So we can take this guy and add it back in and account for that, right? So this is called end around carry. And end around carry is simply this idea that we're going to take however many times across the modulus and add it back in. If we're only dealing with two numbers, only a few ones. Now there's one other important concept to touch on. There is such a thing as overflow. Overflow brings into an important contrast how we know this, this can be true. So if I have, keep it simple, we'll do two of my favorite engine sizes from back when I was a kid, 305 and 350. If I add these two numbers together, let's see what happens. You guys still even do engine sizes and cubic inches and just liters? It's all liters now. Sorry. Let me forget. All right. What's wrong with this answer? It's not a number. Correct, because it's negative, right? How do you add two positive numbers and end up with negative? You can't. This is overflow. This is legitimate overflow. There's nothing I'm going to do to fix this. I'm going to throw it away. Some computers, like I'm not going to get into logistics of whether or not it's fixable. We're just going to assume you throw it away. It's going to cost some amount of transistors and, and complication that we're not willing to deal with. And maybe some places take that cost and maybe some don't. For our purposes, overflow, we chuck it. How do we know it's overflow? We started with two things of the same sign, the sign flipped in the answer. Doesn't matter if they're negative or positive. Just matters that they were the same and the answer flipped. This is overflow gets thrown away. Notice here that the signs were different. I had a negative and a positive. I can't overflow the negative and positive. Like that's impossible. I have two numbers and one's negative, one's positive. It is not possible for me to overflow. So therefore, I know my answer must be legit and I have to deal with the end around carry. All right. That is all of the concepts we need. However, we haven't talked binary and we haven't talked about 
about the logistical difference between the diminished rate X and rate X. Any questions so far? All right. Let's deal with rate X versus diminished rate X. Want to do it quickly in decimal. I'm not going to go all the way through all the math. I might do one of the under on carry to just kind of show the difference. So in three digit tens complement, not nines now, we're off nines, we're on tens. If I want to find, take the complement of negative, I don't know, 200, keep it simple, because this one requires borrowing and I'm lazy. Instead of subtracting it from 999, what am I going to subtract it from? 1,000. Full range. Now this obviously is simple for us humans, but if we're going to be honest about it, what do we have to do here? We have to borrow. I remember which base I'm in with borrowing. And I have to like do the math, right? It's not hard. Oh, I didn't have to borrow yet. What am I talking about? <laughs> borrow over here. It's Friday. It's Thursday. It's my Friday. <laughs> there we go. So that happens when you. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and it's a really special one because we don't have Saturday classes since it's my Friday. So, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, have Friday classes. <laughs> Your Friday's your Friday, Saturday. Friday. That's the worst. <laughs> oh my God. It's <laughs> so bad. Oh. Uh, so that's it. All we did here was make our lives a little bit harder when we did this. Why did we do it? Well, that's simple enough to explain. Let's take 9999 here, our representation, and subtract it from the basis. That used to be negative zero. And look at that. It's negative one. I'm not going to do the bar. You guys know how that works. So now I fixed this. In fact, this became this, and life is happy again. So what does that mean? It's very simple. Let's take this guy and just rework it a little bit. We're going to kind of buzz through it. So we had negative 200 plus 300. We're going to take the complement of this guy, 800. So instead of starting at 799 there, I just push. So 800 plus 300. And I end up with 1100. Now, still not exactly right, but remember we learned this just meant we crossed the modulus. It's going to happen either way. But since there's no negative zero, we no longer care about adding it back in. So you just drop it. And you can be assured that it's okay to drop it because you started with numbers of two different signs. If you had started with numbers of the same sign, that could be overflow if you end up in the wrong place, right? So you gotta just make sure your signs, you gotta just double check. All right. So this is why, this is going to be why, computers are going to prefer Choose top over ones, but I'm still going to start with ones really quick because taking the complement is much easier to express in binary, and then I'll show you the difference when we get to twos. All right, let's flip now to ones comp. So now we're going to go to binary. We're going to live this as the computer do. One thing I want to point out too is there are, I might have said this last time, as far as we're concerned at the moment, yes. Um, what, do, what exactly is the point between using diminished rate X versus regular rate X? Like well, there are, there are computer systems that do use diminished rate X. It does happen. It's rare, but it does. Most do use rate X. So why not just use like one? Well, they do use one. We're learning both because it's easier to understand, like, the, the actual taking the complement a little bit easier with diminished. Um, especially now, you're going to see that in a moment when I do flip this. Um, because that is expressed here where it's not here until you learn a little trick. But I'll show you. I'll, I'll, I'll point that out actually as, as we do it right now. So, what I wanted to say.
say uh, just before is that as far as we're concerned at this moment, we're not concerned about, you know, ends, big ends, small ends, floats, longs, doubles, all these different crazy types, right? Right now, as far as we're concerned in the world, there's two types of numbers, integer, which we're doing now, and real, which have decimal points and we're about to talk about All right, let's talk about one's comp. So if I have four bits, one's comp, we know that the number five looks like this in regular binary, right? This is a five. Now, we also know that if we want to use sine and magnitude, we just flip this to show sine. And this is a five, five in sine and magnitude, right? That's all good. Now, I'm just doing this so we can see that what we're about to do turns out differently. Let's do the same for five in one's comp. So here's my five. What's my basis going to be for one's comp? Yeah. Yeah, so one, one, you're actually right, 15 in decimal, or one, 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 one. So just like you had all nines in decimal, right, you're going to have all ones in binary. So you're absolutely right, it's 15, it's one less than the range, which is 16, it's expressed like that. So just like before, I subtract this out, I'm just in another base, that's all. Anyone see a pattern? They just flopped, they just flipped. So now you can uh, channel your inner late night talk show host and scream, flip it and forget it to yourself, and you'll want to buy it. And it'll be beautiful. Um, and you'll remember it because you can just flip it and forget it. So, the beauty of this, especially for diminished rate x, is that the not gate, which is symbolized like this in a computer, is the cheapest and simplest gate you can build. It consists of exactly one transistor. One. This guy is fast and cheap, and you can do it all day long. So if I want to take the complement of something, all I have to do is send it through a bunch of not gates. And by a bunch, I just mean one for every digit. And that's it. I've taken the complement. So this is super fast, super efficient, super easy for the computer. I get computer a negative number, it flips through some not gates, it stores it like that. That's all. So now, remember, we're in ones. We haven't got into twos yet. What is the difference? between ones and twos. Well, let's let's explore that. So here was, let's add it to the file here. So we have one zero, one zero. This is ones comp. Let's see what twos comp looks like. Let's do that one right here. So I have my five. And what is my basis gonna be for twos comp? 16, which is one zero 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 zero. Now this is obviously a little bit more of a pain in the ass, right? I have to actually borrow all the way across this time. There we go. And I gotta do the math. Oh, the excruciating pain. There we go. That is a five. And two's come. There you go. All the fives of the world. I can't invent any more. I'm good with those four. So, anyone see perhaps a easier way to do this? Yeah. It's the same thing as one's comps in your side. Correct. So, easier for us, easier for the computer is I can still flip it. So, here's five. There's one's comp, I'm adding one, I have two's comp. Why did this work? Yeah? Because one, 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 one plus one is one, zero, 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 zero. Correct. I subtracted it from a number that was one bigger. The number I subtracted from is always going to be one bigger. 
So if I just do the smaller one and add one, I got the same result. An incrementer is another circuit that a computer has a plethora of and is very fast. Incrementing a number is again super simple for a computer. So to stick a number through some NOT gates and then to increment it is easy. Easy peasy. Computer loves it. Can do that all day long. So this is a super simple way that handles bringing numbers from the negative space into representations that we can then use to always do positive arithmetic. And the arithmetic that we saw in base 10 is completely the same in base 2, except it's in base 2. Let's do um, one example with end around carry, just to kind of bring a closure to it in two time. And then we're going to go on to floating. By the way, all of these sheets, like these you know, sheets, I actually have, I think, like two different versions of these are up in Ireland. So um, use them, write up the thing, study from them, practice doing the math yourself, and check yourself because they're there. All right. Uh, where am I? Overflow. Here we are. Let's do 45. No, that's over. And around carry, here we go. 106 plus negative two. So obviously we can just eyeball this and know it's gonna be one, right? I'm gonna save us the, the hassle of, of 106. Translate that for us. This 106, I have a 64 and 32, so that's 96. And an eight is 104, the two is 106, right? So just adding those weights up to my head, that's 106. The negative two, let's let's so I don't mess up my math here. Let's do a two. Flip it. I add one. This is negative two, right? And two is not. So now I can bring that guy down here. All right. Now we just do the math. We end up with this. Remember, we have another digit here. We expect that. We're going to say cross modulus, you go away. With two's comp, we don't have to add it back in, right? We just can't make it go away. Now we can look at this and say, okay, 64 and 32 is still 96, and 8 is 104. Okay. We were comfortable with throwing this away because our signs are different, right? We knew it wasn't overflow. Just remember, if your signs are the same and you end up in a good spot, then it's overflow. But if your signs are different, you're good. Just end around carry, throw it away, move on with life. Remember, if I ask you an end around carry problem, if one's come, be very aware of what you're in. You have to add the end around carry back in because it's minus rate x. And choose comp, you don't. The reason is because there's no negative zero. Everybody okay? Questions? Online crew, how are you doing? Everyone good? Yeah, we're good. All right. I think I'm good. Sweet. Yep, we're good. All right. Let's talk floating. So I said we hadn't done any real numbers, except for binary coded decimal. We did do real numbers there. But again, those are for calculators, mostly mainframes. Um, still important, your banking system depends on them, and it still does today. Uh, but our regular computers are not using that normally to do decimal. 
they're using floating point, which we're going to talk about now. So the first thing to talk about is a scientific number, scientific notation. Let's make it negative. Let's give it a base. So the first thing we need to know is what do we need to store here? This is what we have to work with. This is the number of the system that we're going to use. Why are we going to use it? I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. But the ability of having this exponent means that we can move this decimal. So why that's important will become clear a little while. So this is a good format for us to use for reasons I will prove to you. But there's a lot of parts to it. I have a sign of the number which, by the way, this is called the mantissa. Okay. So you're going to hear me calling it the mantissa. So just be aware of what I'm talking about. This is called the mantissa. I have a sign for the mantissa. I have a placement of the decimal point, the location of it. It could be here, it could be here, it could be there. It's got to be somewhere, right? I have a magnitude of the mantissa, which obviously takes five digits in this example. I have a base of the mantissa. It's base 10. I then have an exponent base, base 10 for the exponent. I have a sign of the exponent. This one's negative. And I have a magnitude of the exponent. This one is a magnitude of three, right? So there's a lot to unpack here. We just kind of look at it and know what it is, but there's a lot going on here. So how do we encode this? Well, the answer is we're going to encode it into this, all of it. Spot for the sign of the mantissa, our exponent encoded in a way I'm going to show you, and the value of the mantissa. So we make a lot of assumptions here. The first assumption we make is that the decimal point is always going to be here. Always. It's always going to be at the front of the mantissa. It's never going to be here. It's always going to be there. That's assumption number one. The other big assumption we make, and that you, it's safe to make for this purpose, is that it's always in base 10. That the number we're working with, whether it's encoded in binary or not, when we are working with the number, just kind of like binary code and decimal, it is a base 10 number. All right? So you don't need this, and you don't need that. And you don't need that, because we know where it is. So what we have left is this sign, which is going to go here as either a zero or anyone want to take a guess what the, the negative number is going to be? Could be a one, but not normally. Normally it's going to be something else. It's going to be a five. Any thoughts on why? Why five? Yeah. Five is the uh, carry around. Well, it represents, so in decimal, it represents the start of negative space for half of the range. But also, if you think about what it's actually translating down to here, normally we need four bits, we said, to represent a single binary number, right? But hypothetically, I'm sorry, a single decimal number, binary, just binary to go to decimal. But because we're actually storing this and we're not using an eight or a nine, we actually can get away with three. So we could say that it could be you know, one, zero, one, but whatever, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that when it goes to binary, you're going to want either a zero or a one, and then we know that when we deal with binary, it's the order of magnitude, which is half the range or any other bit. So it's just kind of traditionally shown this way for half the range or the negative side of the decimal range, just like we did in complementary, or if you had done some kind of sign and magnitude the same kind of thing. So that's just going to be a zero or a five. So for us, it's going to be a five, right? Because we have a negative number in this example. I'm just going to take the zero out. I'm going to come back to the exponent. I want to do that last. The mantis is easy. The one, two, three, four, five, that just comes across. I have five digits of precision in this example. Now, just so you know, what this example represents is not some infinitesimally small version of the floating point number. It's actually approximately 
what you can do with the 32 bit floating point number in decimal. And I said approximately because you might have already picked up that this would use more bits than necessary. And there's a few other optimizations we can make. But for all intents and purposes, this is roughly what you can fit in a 32 bit floating point number. Now, obviously, we use 64 bit nowadays. I'm not going to bother with that because it's just way too much on the board and way too much mass. But it gives you an idea of, of what's at stake as far as how much precision you can lose by moving things around. Our exponent now is what we have left. So we said we don't care about the base, we're going to assume it. So we have this negative three. How do we put that? Well, I'll show you. It's going to go in like this. Yeah, that's weird. So what happened there is what's called Exodus end notation, sometimes called Exodus end 50 notation, um, but Exodus end notation. What happens is that you essentially, when you're encoding it, you take 50, you subtract the exponent, and that gives you what you encode. When you're decoding it, you take the encoded value, you subtract 50, and you end up with the exponent. So you essentially subtract 50 when you're reading the floating point number. You subtract 50 from it, it gives you your value. So if I wanted a positive 3, I'd have a 53 now. I'd subtract 50, I'd end up with a positive 3. This roughly does the same thing for us that we've done now a few times. We found a way to encode negative numbers into the same by using range. Yeah. So are you technically adding to the 50? Uh, is it just because it's negative 50 that we're subtracting? Like if it was, you said like if it was positive, it was just normal 3, you said it would be 53? Yeah, so you're right. It, when you do it here, you're taking the sign with it. So if it was a positive 3, you'd be adding 3 and you end up. But what you're doing here remains the same. It's always subtracting 50. Is that okay? All right. So that's it. Now it's a little tricky. This is another thing to remember, but it's not complicated. All right. It's just whatever you have here, you subtract 50 from it. That's your exponent in either positive or negative space. Oh, of course. Yes. What is this for? Like what? Like I'm a little confused. Like so any decimal. So any number that has a decimal point. If you're using floating point, this is how the computer is stable. And this is only if the decimal doesn't have a digit in front of the decimal? Nope. It's if it does. It, so what happens, well, I'm actually going to show you that with the math, is that we have to normalize the mantissa to always put this here. So if your number, let's say it was 5, right? 3.14156. I have to bring this here and say times 10 to the one. Now, why did I do the one? Does anyone know? Correct. And so here's the rule. So that, that's a good lead in. This is a good segue to what we're just going to talk about, which is whenever you're moving the decimal point, if I make this number smaller, if I make the mantissa smaller, I make the exponent bigger. The exponent by default was 10 to the zero, right? So I made this smaller, I made this bigger. If I make this smaller, I make this, I'm sorry, if I make this bigger, because I'm moving the decimal point this way, if I made this 31, I know that I wouldn't have done that because I need decimal over there, but if I had for some reason, this would have went smaller, right? So it's an opposite reaction to what you do in the mantissa to what you do in the exponent. So you can always store it this way, even if it's, Got a whole number in front. Does that help? Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Any other questions on this before I do the, the math? All right, yes. It's kind of reasonable, but if you hit a point where the decimal is going to be beyond 50 places from the start. So there's algorithms to kind of deal with that, but that's loss of precision. So if you ever hear about like floating point precision and, and how it's troublesome, You've identified it. Now, I did start by saying this is a little less precision than 32-bit, and the honest reality is we use at least 64 today. So there can be a lot of precision um, in a modern computer, but if you go back far enough, yeah, that was a problem. 
So, um, you know, that's that's one of the reasons why storage and, and money we throw at it is so important, you know, and how much RAM we put in our computer matters for these kinds of things. Um, but yeah, much better today than it used to be. Um, but that's also why binary code and decimal is still kicking, right? Because there are times where this just isn't a great solution because of the numbers. It might be infinitesimally small, maybe you're measuring something like a collision in a collider, right? And you're dealing with really small numbers. It might not be the right choice. Or maybe you write code to just ignore a certain subset of zeros that you know will always be there. You know what I mean? So there's other solutions too. For the general normal numbers, this is what we got. All right. So the math now, let's do this. We'll leave this part, flip over here. So I will not ask you multiplication or division. However, I might ask you about the mechanics of it. I will go over that after I do addition and subtraction. Um, but essentially, what we're going to do is this. We're going to start with two floating point numbers. So I have 0, 5, 1, 9, 9, 5, 2, 0, and 0, 4, 9, 6, 7, 8, 5, 0. These are my two encoded floating point values. Let's grab the first one here and bring it over to scientific notation. We have to do that to do the math. I like to start with Mantissa. So I know my decimal point is right here. 9, 9, 5, 2, 0, times 10. I'll get to the exponent in a moment. What's my sign? Positive. positive. Yep, so the zero is just positive. They're both positive, so that'll be easy. This guy now, what is, you want to take a stab at what my exponent will be? Yeah, just one. Just one. Sorry, it's trying to put the out. I got the one. Now I'm going to add this to a positive, so I'm just going to put this plus a little bit over to denote that we are adding uh, 6, 7, 8, 5, 0 times 10. This one is 49, so we have the opposite. We have negative one. Now I'm going to bring you back to, I honestly don't remember when we learned this, but let's say it was either late grade school or junior high. When you might have done math in this, I'm sure you did, you probably blocked it out like I did. Um, the important part is that you have to have, when you're doing addition and subtraction, exponents that match. We do not. So the easiest way to deal with that is bring the smaller exponent up. It actually doesn't matter how you deal with it, but it's just good to pick one way and stick it. So we're going to do it that way. So what that means is that, remember, this number will change for every time I change that exponent by making it bigger, which I'm going to do twice, from negative 1 to 0, and from 0 to 1, I'm going to make this number smaller twice. So my decimal point is going to move out this way twice. So what I'm going to end up with is this. I'm going to just bring the top one down here, and I'm going to end up with 0 0.006. Seven, eight, five, zero, times 10 to the 1. Now they're both times 10 to the 1. So I'm happy because I can do my math. Now, one thing that's important to note is this guy already fell out of precision. Because you're humans and you're capable of doing it, and we don't really care what hardware is and isn't, and we'll just leave for the possibility, I want you to maybe mark it with parentheses, but keep track of it. So we might use it, as I'll show you in a moment. But notice we've already gone out of our pursuit, right? So that's lost information to us, possibly. So we're going to do the math. 5, 0 comes down. 8, 9, this is 11, 10, 10, bang, times 10 to the 1. Now we have. Well, we have a little bit of a mess. What's wrong with this? Can I store this right now as floating point? Nope, I have to normalize it. And I have to normalize it by again making the mantis smaller, which means I make the exponent bigger. Right? Smaller mantis, bigger exponent. Now I can normalize this. Notice that one, two, three, four, five. 
I now have, well, sorry, one, two, three, four, five. I now have three digits out of precision. So what I would recommend doing, this is why I asked you to keep track of them, is to round. We have 850 here. So I'm going to say that rounds this to a mantissa of 10020. Now I'm going to encode my exponent, which is 52. And I'm going to note that I have a sign on the mantissa of 0. So I've now re-encoded this back to floating point notation. Congratulations. Now, before we diverge uh, and, and call it a day, a couple of notes. One is, I won't ask you this to do as math, but I want you to know the principle of how it works. Remember that multiplication and division of exponents is treated differently. You don't actually have to make the exponents match. So if this was a multiplication problem, you would add the exponents and multiply the mantises. And if it was a division problem, you would subtract the exponents and divide the mantises. Dividing numbers like this and multiplying them are just a mess. And I'm not that kind of person to beat you up with that. So I'm just going to stick to addition and subtraction. But in one way, it's harder because you have to remember to normalize and get those exponents in mind. So that's important. So it actually just teaches it better anyway. Um, other than that, that's pretty straightforward. Just pay also special attention to how I ask for the answer. I might ask for it in floating point notation like this, or I might ask for it in scientific notation. So just make a note of that. Like obviously, I'm going to dock your old points if you mess that one up. But you said for uh, multiplication, you're going to end up multiplying the pieces together and then adding to adding the two exponents. Yep. All right, any questions? <laughs>